Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here this evening. Lord, my heart is thrilled just to stand behind the pulpit. Lord, that place where the Word of God is expounded, where the authority of heaven meets earth. And Father, I'm so thankful for the Spirit of God that you promised to give us once Christ was glorified and you sent Him to the earth. And, and you baptized us, putting us into one body, the body of Christ. And now we have the Spirit of God to lead us into truth. And Lord, we ask tonight that you would give us discernment. Lord, that you would give us insight and wisdom into the things that are going on today. And Lord, your word even says that your spirit is the spirit of truth. And so, Lord, we depend upon the spirit of truth this evening. Father, I ask in the mighty name of Jesus that you lead the one who teaches, preaches tonight. Let your words be in my mouth. I surrender myself as an empty vessel for your glory. For we pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Garth told me a story. He was coming home from the office one night and came across this man standing on the Ninth Street Bridge getting ready to jump off. And so uh, as Garth approached him, he said, uh, Stop, don't do that, don't jump. And the guy responded and said, well, why shouldn't I jump? And Garth told me, he said, well, there's so much to live for. The guy said, well, like what? He says, well, are you religious? Garth said. Well, the man said, yes. Garth said, well, me too. He says, are you a Christian or are you a Buddhist? The man said, I'm a Christian. Garth said, me too. He asked him, now, are you Catholic? Or Protestant? The man said, I'm Protestant. Gar said, me too. He said, now let me ask you, are you Episcopal or are you Baptist? The guy said, well, I'm a Baptist. And Gar said, well, me too. He said, now let me ask you, are, are you Baptist Church of God or are you Baptist Church of the Lord? He said, well, I'm Baptist Church of God. And Gar said, well, me too. And so he said, well, let me ask you, are you Reformed Baptist Church of God? Or are you Original Baptist Church of God? And the guy said, well, I'm Reformed Baptist Church of God. And Garth said, well, brother, me too. And so Garth said, well, let me ask you, are you Northern Reformed Baptist Church of God? Or are you Southern Reformed Baptist Church? Church of God. He says, well, brother, I am Northern Reformed Baptist Church of God. And at this point, Garth is just so excited. He's met a fellow brother. They're eye to eye in their beliefs. He said, well, let me ask you this. Are you Northern Reformed Baptist Church of God General Council of 1915? <laughs> or are you Northern Reformed Baptist Church of God General Council? 1895. And he said, I'm general counsel of 1915. And Garth pushed him and said, die you heretic. <laughs> I couldn't believe that happened to him. We like to make these kinds of distinctions and label ourselves this and this and this and this. But tonight I want to talk about just mere Christianity as C.S. Lewis talked about it. I want to shed all of the uh, garb of whether or not you're Baptist or Pentecostal and simply talk about if you're a Bible-believing, which nowadays has the title Evangelical. Evangelicalism was a response to the modernist fundamentalist debate back in the early part of the 20th century. And so evangelical were those that took the Bible literally. They had commitment to the fundamentals of faith, but they were ones that didn't separate themselves from the culture, but they wanted to engage the culture intellectually. And so the evangelical community are those who believe the fundamentals of the faith, but we believe in dealing with the culture intellectually. 
But there is a change in the land. Now, some of the things I'm going to talk about tonight are going to uh, reiterate what Pastor Barth has said. But I want to build a firm foundation for where I'm going to show you what is happening in the church and how, as our title for tonight is, Love Without Truth, The Decay of Doctrine. Love Without Truth, The Decay of Doctrine. Doctrine is decaying in our day. Truth is is decaying in our day. We live in a postmodern, relativistic, pluralistic, individualized world. People look to me, 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 me. And we see that cultural change. And I want to share with you what happened in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, and up to today, just so that you can get a sense of where we're at, what the church is going to have to do to get past this time in order to really make an impact on the culture. We need to evangelize this culture for the glory of God, and we need to do it biblically. We don't want to compromise the fundamentals of the faith, but we want to reach this culture for the glory of God, and we want to reach this culture with the truth. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and we need to stand up for truth, but do it in a very gentle and understanding way without compromise. So Paul told the Ephesian church, he said, speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. Now, love without truth is emotionalism. Truth without love is legalism. But love with truth is is realism or verism. It is the way things are. You need to be loving and tell the truth. You need to stand in the truth and be loving. And it is a fine balance that we find ourselves in need of standing today. We need to reach the culture, but we do it in truth and in love, and we don't let any slide on the pendulum any other way. Too much love, you begin to have doctrinal decay, too much truth, you begin to have legalism, and the world sees the church now as hypocritical, homophobic, self-righteous, people you just don't want to be around. And as a pastor for 20-some years, no longer a senior pastor, I can tell you there was a time in my life where I did not like church folk because in many ways they're self-righteous, hypocritical, and I can go on and on, and you know you, you know what I'm talking about. I've been through four church splits under Southern Baptists. We major on the minors, minor on the majors, and the world looks at us, and the world sees us as who we are. We are not speaking the truth in love, and now they see the church as compromising truth. Well, there was this change in culture, and Time Magazine chronicled a story called Generation Xmas. If you know how the sociologists bring up the generations, you know that I am a Generation X. I was born in 1971. My children are part of the millennials. And there is a drastic change in Generation X and the millennials that are for the boomers, the baby boomers. Many of you who were born post-World War II, you're baby boomers. You guys are the ones that started the 60s rebellion. And we are your children, and your grandchildren are the millennials. And let me tell you, society has gone downhill since the 60s. And we'll show you why that is in the coming moments. But Time Magazine ran an article called Generation Xmas, and they chronicled the change in the quintessential American Christmas movie. Now many of you have probably seen some of these movies. One of the movies is It's a Wonderful Life. Another one is A Christmas Story or Miracle on 34th Street. And there was this drastic change in the culture that is epitomized in the favorite Christmas movie. And let me share with you what this Times editor wrote. He talked about the fact that there is this change in the culture. There is this story of the wonderful life where you have George Bailey and he's 
suicidal. And you know that he goes and uh, wants to die. He's on that bridge. So good thing Garth didn't run into him or he would have pushed George Bailey off, right? <laughs> Just kidding. But anyway, he's, he's suicidal. And the whole story is about him realizing that uh, if he wasn't born, uh, the world would be a different place. And uh, at the end of the movie, you know the savings and loan is saved and he gets a $25,000 loan for the poor in the community and it's about community. And at the very end, he's running through town telling everybody Merry Christmas. He'd probably get arrested for that nowadays. And he gets and he's calling Mary, Mary, I can't do a Jimmy Stewart impression. But you get the picture, you see this, and at the very end of the movie, everybody's together. It's community, they're singing songs, Christmas songs, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. And they're loving one another. And at the very end, you know, Clarence, his guardian angel, every time a, a bell rings, an angel gets its wings. And he opens up the book that was left and it said, when you have friends, no one is a failure. And the idea of community is there. But look at the change that happened in the favorite movie. Now it's a Christmas story. You have a, a satire, a myth deflating, down-to-earth, cranky Santa Claus that actually kicks Ralphie down the slide. And it's all about what the kid wants for Christmas. I want that BB gun. It becomes me, me, me. And you remember, you shoot your eye out with that kid. The culture transitioned from community to individualism. And along with that, truth has changed and our perspective of truth has changed. Our perspective and our relationship to one another, relationship and community has changed. And we'll see how some of the church leaders today, they have caught on to some of it, but they've dropped the truth aspect of the gospel. If the church doesn't drastically change, evangelicalism is going to die. Right now we're fighting the battle over inerrancy, whether or not the Bible has errors in it. Amazing that we would be discussing that in the church today. And as Pastor God said, there's been no discovery of manuscripts. There hasn't been some big archaeological discovery that shows that the Bible errors. No, it's all a worldview. It's all a paradigm change. It's all a change in mentality. It's a philosophy that has come into the church and the society that is individualistic. You see yourself as the sole proprietor of truth and morality and everything stops with you. You are the captain of your ship. You are the one that determines reality. You are the one who has the ability to define truth in the way that you want it. One scholar said this, he says, we live in a dictatorship of relativism and it's being formed. One that recognizes nothing is definitive and that has its measure only the self and its desires. We're living in a relativistic culture, and it only has as the authoritative, definitive aspect of life as yourself and your desires. You can imagine what kind of philosophy of life that continues to grow and what that is going to do to the culture and to the church, where everybody sees themselves as little bitty islands. It used to be that you were concerned about what the community thought about you. It's still like that in Eastern cultures, but now it doesn't matter. People are seeking fame for the sake of fame. People nowadays are famous for being famous. And there's no shame. It's all about the individual and what I can get and what I determine to be right and wrong. It's a new spiritualism. It's a paganism. It's what they call a syncretism. People are mixing and matching, pulling together this thought, pulling together that thought. This is my truth, and my truth is my truth, and that's your truth, and your truth is your truth. And they've begun to look at religion that way as well. One of the most startling things that I discovered in doing my research is this, that people nowadays will adjust their religious views to their political views. I want you to think about that for a moment. 
People today will adjust their religious views according to their political views. There's a few reasons why that has happened and why you see in the evangelical church things changing and things moving in this way where we have dumbed down the truth and we emphasize individualism, relativism. Nobody says anything about whether or not homosexuality is wrong or abortion is wrong. We've come to be a group of people that despise politics. I do too. And I'm talking about the younger generations. The millennials, they despise politics. And that has caused some of the leaders in the emergent church to not even talk about those kinds of things. And not only just not talk about it, but now embracing it. We're living in a decay of truth that's happened to the church before. Interesting enough, it happened in the 4th century. Many put uh, a lot of stuff on Constantine when he became a Christian. He had a vision of the Cairo, which is just the, uh, the Greek letters. Chi, or Chi, however you want to pronounce it, and Rho, which is the first two letters of the name of Christ. And so he went to battle and he conquered in the name of Christ, and so he adopted Christianity. And we call the end of the 4th century right up to the beginning of the 5th century the early Middle Ages, or the early Dark Ages. There began to have a decay of truth that happened in the church. It wasn't Constantine that did it, but it was Theodosius that did it. And it happened to be on February 27, 380 AD, where he officially adopted Christianity as the religion of the Roman Empire. And it was at that point that Christianity was merged with paganism. There was a spirituality in the land still, but it was superstition. There was the mixture, this amalgamation of all kinds of beliefs, all kinds of superstition. As the church grew, as the church was mobilized, as the church was multiculturalized, you find that now you have this great multitude of people within the church, and it's very superstitious. Relics began to have their importance. Icons began to have their importance. It became a very visual culture. If you understand a little bit of postmodernism, you can see the parallel. Very, very spiritual. Look at all the TV shows out there today. Ghosts and ghost hunters, and I like them too. But there's a spirituality that people are interested in. There's a spirituality that's there, but it's a pagan spirituality. There's a paganism that is in the church. It happened in the early... Middle Ages or the early Dark Ages, and now the postmodernism and relativism that is in the church once again. Highly visual. Look at the way that we do church here on, at Shelter Cove. I'm not saying it's bad, but look at how we have become a very visual society. Very, very visual. We have moved away from the idea of books and text and truth propositions in what we would call syllogisms and, and rational categories and propositions. We slip away and now we look at pictures and we try to get people to emote by bringing about the music and the pictures and we try to grab them emotionally and we've set aside the, the brain altogether. We live in the most non-intellectual time in the history of the church, even the dark Middle Ages. And when the church has ceased to think about their Christian faith, you can only imagine the kind of stuff that slips in. And I'm going to give you some quotes later on of where the doctrinal commitments of these evangelicals that are trying to reach these postmoderns, these pluralists, they're trying to reach them, but what they're doing is they're forgetting about the truth. They're forgetting about the truth. And now everybody has their own truth. We'll talk in just a moment of, of this phrase, truthiness, that Stephen Colbert coined. Wikiality, another phrase coined, where the democratization of truth has happened. Everybody agrees upon what's true, and now it's true. We live in a very, very scary time. 
We live in a time that we as a church, we must understand where we're at and we must be able to reach this culture. If you have your Bible, turn 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32. Very interesting, very obscure passage of Scripture, but it speaks to where we need to be in the church, especially understanding the times. Israel was in a very rough situation. And we find this very obscure passage in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32. And he says that the man of Issachar, who had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do. Very interesting. Where do we hear these men of Issachar? Well, one of the tribes that are going to be in the millennium, one of the 144,000 in Revelation chapter 7. But we find that Jacob gives a prophecy about the men of Issachar, and he calls them a strong donkey, which was a compliment. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't take too kind to somebody calling me a strong donkey. Uh, nowadays it's about stubbornism, but, but he was strong. He, had a, he, he was a workman, which is kind of a play on words here with the Hebrew. Issachar, a, a workman, a hired man. But these men of Issachar, there was something very interesting about them. They understood the times. Did you know that people, when they don't understand the times, they're far more subject to repeat the errors of the past? They're far more subject to be sucked in to the whims of the day? We need to, as a church, understand the times. We need to be intellectual in our faith which is what apologetics is all about. We need to understand the times. We need to understand the people that we're trying to reach with the gospel. We need to understand all the facets, sociologically, psychologically, anthropologically, all the ologies we need to know in order that we can reach people. All of the study, all of the bookworming I do is simply for one Thing and one thing only, to be a better Christian Amen. so that I can reach people. That's what it's about. That's what it's about. We need to understand the times and know what we ought to do. Have you, how many of you have ever read C.S. Lewis? C.S. Lewis, one of my favorite authors. He has this book called The Pilgrim's Regress. And there's a chapter in it called Through the Dark Zeitgeistum, which is a German word. Zeitgeist simply has to do with the, that which is representative of the time that you live in. Uh, also referred to as the spirit of the age. The spirit of the age. C.S. Lewis talks about John, who was this pilgrim, going through to the island that he holds, which symbolizes heaven. And he is... Uh, in the land of the spirit of the age. And the spirit of the age is this great overshadowing mountain. And he gets thrown into prison. He gets put in chains and thrown into the prison of the spirit of the age. Most like many of us, if we don't have eyes to see, we don't have understanding and to know what God wants us to do in the midst of the culture that we live in, we find that we are chained, we are shackled by the spirit of the age. John is there and he has these uh, encounters and he has uh, very interesting things that happen. Some come out and sing a song. Some come out and just sing just nonsense. And then he's ridiculed. Well, you don't know what is music and what's not music. And it's a music and noise are the same thing. And they go on and he talks about food and nourishment and how nourishment and refuse and food, are, it's all the same thing. And then he talks about how he's eating an egg and drinking milk for breakfast and yet they're just secretions of animals. One is the secretion of a chicken and the other one is the secretion of a cow. And the spirit of the age, those that are tied up in there say there's no difference. There's no difference between art and pornography. Pornography and art, you see that there is this, there is this redefining of what is right and what is wrong, what is sacred and what is secular, what is good, what is pure, what is right and what is evil. It's mixed up, it's redefined by our 
dark spirit of the age that we live in. And we find that even in the shadow of the spirit of age, John is sitting there and he begins to see every other human being as nothing but bone and sinew and muscle and intestines. And the spirit of the age tells us today that people are judging nothing but the bones and sinews. It's called reductionism. Nothing but the bone, the sinew. Humans are nothing but biological animals. Human beings are just animals with instincts just like the rest of the animal kingdom. And therefore we can let off the shackles of this Puritanism that's in America. This morality that's in America. We can shed those things. And we can live in freedom in the spirit of the age. But yet John is actually shackled underneath the spirit of the age. How is he rescued? Well, C.S. Lewis writes that that reason, she, she rides in on this great stallion and she confounds the spirit of the age with three riddles. And then she takes her sword and stabs the heart of the spirit of the age and it crumbles to be just a, a, a heel of dust and rubble. And John is free. That's an allegory of really where we're at in the culture today. Many of us have been chained by the culture. Many of us are imprisoned by the spirit of the age because we can't see and understand the times. And in the evangelical church, people are in prison to the zeitgeist of the age, the spirit of the age. How in the world did we get here? Genesis chapter 3. If you would turn there with me. Genesis chapter 3. A very familiar passage. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field. And the Lord God, that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God actually say, you should not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruits of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Let's unpack that for a moment. Look at what Satan did. First, he questioned God's word. He said, did God really say? He's questioning divine authority. He's questioning the character, the nature of God. And then he says, you, you surely won't die. There's a greater spiritual realm out there. And death is but an illusion. It's a path to a higher consciousness, a, a higher realm of oneness. You'll not surely die. And then the enemy says... If you eat of it, you'll be like God. And then here's the interesting point of all of that. You'll be like God. You'll, you'll be your true self. You'll be divine. And with that comes the knowledge of good and evil. With your divinity comes, and here's the real kicker. The knowledge of good and evil is simply this. You now are the authority in your life. God is not the authority. You are divine and you have the ability to define what is good and what is evil. Pornography is art and art is pornography. Good is evil and evil is good. It's all the lie from the evil one that started in the garden. And we see it prevalent in postmodernism. You are your God. You are your authority. Everything stops with you. You determine truth. Now if you back up to the 1950s, post-World War II, America was in a good place. We won the war. I still believe that that generation is a generation of heroes. My grandfather was a part of it. 
I love that generation and what they did for the free world. Now in the 1950s, the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age was very interesting. It was symbolized by the Ten Commandments. And it was the Ten Commandments that were sent out by Cecil B. DeMille to publicize the movie, The Ten Commandments. Has everybody seen the movie, The Ten Commandments? Cecil B. DeMille sent those out to government agencies, county offices, and those are actually some of the monuments that people are going to court to get rid of. And that was the zeitgeist. That was the spirit of the age in the 1950s. The 1950s were the time that produced the In God We Trust model that's on our money. The 1950s were the time that put in the Pledge of Allegiance under God. The country was in a place where morality was the spirit of the age. God's defining of what is right and what is wrong was the symbol of the age. Now, I have my opinions on what happened. People are people. Even though there was this external sign of the spirit of the age, there was those that didn't live according with it. There was this very religious aspect in the culture. And the children who were the children of those of World War II began to see that it was just a hard, self-righteous religion. And they started the first social earthquake with two subsequent aftershocks that have shaped the world that we're in today. The first one was the sexual revolution of the 1960s. Free love. Drug abuse was rampant. What's actually interesting is you can trace the cultural woes back to one single moral issue that began to change in the culture. And that was the opinion of premarital sex. Homosexuality, really the premarital sex. Abortion, premarital, premarital sex. The contraception issue with the Catholic Church, people were having premarital sex. The morality, gender distinctions, the family, the core of society was attacked by promiscuity, children being born out of wedlock. What are we going to do? We're going to kill them. Sorry to be so blunt, but that's exactly the way the scripture speaks. At the moment of conception, there is everything that is there for a human being in potency. DNA, you are distinct from your mother at the moment of conception. And we have allowed this change in the spirit of the age. Remember, it, it, it's just a fetus. It's just cells. The way we look at people, our anthropology is connected to the spirit of the age today. Now the sad thing is they've been turned into political issues. With how the church actually adjusted in order to reach these people, but they did it the wrong way. They did it the wrong way. So, first major earthquake, the sexual revolution. 1966, Time Magazine carried the cover, Is God Dead? Look at what happened to the 60s. I mean, yeah, it produced some good music, but man, other than that, the 60s ripped up our society and our culture. 1970 comes around. Now, here's the second aftershock. Now there is a response, a reaction to the free love of the 60s, and now there's this prudish revolution. And that's what the sociologists call it. There's a, a prudish revolution. And now you have growth in conservative religion, growth in evangelicalism, the church growth movement starts up, and now there's a merger between religion and the Republican Party. You can see where I'm going with all of this. You've got in 1977 or 76, 
You have the first publicly identified born again president, Jimmy Carter. People began to say religion is important in politics. And you've got Jerry Falwell, the, the moral majority, the religious right. You've got all of these tag names that go along with this movement. And religion became important politically. And now again you've got evangelicalism and the conservative party, republicanism, so intertwined that it's almost assumed that if you're a Christian, you're a Republican. And if you're a Republican, you're a Christian. Now actually, a lot of that ends up being true. Distinguished on whether or not you pray grace before your meals, you can tell somebody's political party. Just a little bit of extra information there. <laughs> if you bow your head, I'm going to say Republican. But evangelicalism and politics became more and more a part. That was a terrible decision on the part of the church. Yes, these are moral issues. Yes, we need to be involved as individuals to vote. But let me tell you, Jesus doesn't care about Republican, Democrat, or Independent, or Green Party, or whatever. He cares about the morality, absolutely. But because of all of that, and now you've got my age group, Children of the Boomers, in the 80s, great music from the 80s as well. I thought I was going to be a rock star. I had hair down to pass the middle of my back. I was actually skinny at that time, played drums, bass, guitar, sang a little bit. And I, I was going to be an 80s rock star, I tell you. But God had other plans. <laughs> I'm glad he had other plans. But what happens, you got my generation now, when we see this happening in society. And 1990 is the third earthquake, the second aftershock from the 1960s. And now what you have is you have a rejection of evangelicalism and conservative politics. And now, just 10 years later, people say in a poll, religion is not important to public office. And now you have Bill Clinton. And we saw the fiasco that happened with that, the moral relativity that happened with that. And boy, he influenced a lot of children that would be my children's age. We have a niece that's 24 years old that lives with us. She's right in that category. Now sexual promiscuity is just going crazy. Now people think they can be involved in certain acts and it's not sex. They're rejecting conservatism. They're rejecting religion. This social demographic called the nuns, N-O-N-E-S. No religious affiliation, no church attendance. It's now about 30% of our culture. And that's where these postmodern leaders are trying to reach these people, but they're trying to do it with the same mentality. Truth is individualized. We don't like uh, conservative politics, especially Republican, so we're going to embrace homosexual lifestyle. We're going to embrace uh, abortion rights. We're going to embrace all of these things that are immoral, thinking that it's love thinking that they're loving people by accepting their lifestyle. Now you can definitely love an individual in sin. The Apostle Paul, when he was writing to the Corinthians, he says, when I told you to disassociate with sinners, I wasn't at all talking about people in the world. We should have friends in the world. We should love those who are homosexuals. We shouldn't cringe and look at them like it's any other sin. Or like it's some big sin and everything else is, is little. There's liars in the church. There's fornicators in the church. 
There's homosexuals in the church that struggle. Now, can you be a liar and be a Christian? No. Can you be a fornicator and be a Christian? No. Now, can you struggle? Yeah, you can struggle. But I'm talking about habitually. Can you habitually practice homosexuality and be a Christian? No. Because we're getting to what Scripture has to say. Can you kill unborn babies? No. But you see this backlash that happened from the conservative politics that, that uh, came together in the 70s and 80s. And now the 90s started off with the culture wars. You've got books written, best-selling New York Times selling books. Bart Ehrman, he writes books that tell you how the Bible is not true. Millions of copies sold. Christopher Hitchin, millions of copies sold of how religion is horrible. How religion is, is, is the woe of society. How religion is the cause of all the political problems, all the economic problems, all the ecological problems. It's all religion. You see the backlash. Richard, uh, Richard Dawkins writing about how creation is not the way God did it anymore. Evolutionary theory is now in there. And, and when I give you some quotes from some of these leaders, you're going to see how they're impacted by pluralism, by relativism, and even by evolutionary theory. Sam Harris writing about the end of faith. Farewell to a Christian nation. On and on and on. And here we are in the 90s. We have pluralism, relativism, individualism, truthiness, wikiality. And that's where the culture is. We also have a great polarization that's taking place in our culture as well. Since 9-11, you have this reaction that's taken place. You've got what is called Christo-Americanism, where people put their uh, patriotism and their Christianity together, and they hate Muslims, and they hate everything else. And then you've got this idea of interfaith is a cool thing now, post-9-11. Don't you find it interesting that Post 9-11, the very people that destroyed the towers are now being protected in political correctness jargon. It's lunacy, and we're going to see here in a moment, it's actually the doctrines of demons and the seducing spirits that people are listening to. I am convinced that postmodernism, relativism, pluralism is indeed the very teaching of Satan and hell itself. Truth is no longer truth. Morality, ah, which is actually one of the four, there is this all moral approach to life now. No morality. Indifferent to all kinds of things. Anybody watch the TV show Big Brother? By any chance? Come on, come on. Guilty pleasure. We watch it. It's fun. You get to see a lot of loonies on TV. But what is so interesting is that I was just taken back by this girl's statement of how she wanted to bed this guy, just not even knowing. We're living in an all moral society. I don't get it. Well, I get it. But I don't get it. We need to understand our times. We need to be like the men of Issachar. Understand our times. Understand where we're at, how we got here, and, and what the Lord requires of us as a church. What does this pluralism look like? Well, it's doctrinal fluidity. Yeah, you roll with the times. People change their religion. People change their doctrinal views. Remember, they align their doctrinal views according to their politics. 
It's the Bill of Rights. There's no particular religion. And with this pluralism, now all religions are seen as equally valid, equally true. And this is all done in the name of love. Love without truth. And it's causing a decay in the very doctrine of professing evangelical Christians. The church is imprisoned by the spirit of the age. We are decaying doctrinally all because we say God is love. There was a survey about how people feel about the doctrine of God. God himself, his nature, his character. A book actually by Paul Forsey and Christopher Batter called America's Four Gods. And 50% of people see God as this benevolent, non-judgmental, one sociologist call it an unkiller God, which means the favorite uncle. Anybody watch Duck Dynasty? I do too. Love Uncle Cy, right? He's called America's favorite uncle. People have that perception of God. God's the nice guy. He's not the dad, you know, that's the disciplinary or the mom that's the disciplinary. But he's the nice, bearded old guy in heaven that just loves everybody. And he's certainly not going to condemn anybody to hell. So that's the doctrine of hell goes. Everybody's going to be saved, so now it's universalism. The doctrine of God has gone to the wayside that we don't have in our culture and, and in the church as well. We don't have an understanding of a biblical God. We just don't. We have created God in our own image, in our own likeness in the church. One author said, a person's God is a direct reflection on the level of moral absolutism, his view of science, his understanding of economic justice, his concept of evil, and how he thinks we should respond to it. God's a loving God. Yeah, but the Bible says that, you know, if you don't believe in him, you'll perish. No, God's loving. The Bible says God is love. And so this relativism and this pluralism has slipped in to the church. If you would look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, this is what the Word of God says. Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith, devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and the teaching of demons through the insincerity of liars whose conscience is seared. Wow. We're seeing that right now. Now, I don't know when Jesus is going to come back. But I know that He's coming back. And I know that He warns us about the last days. What's interesting is now in evangelicalism, this doctrine of Christ coming back is absent from the church. Anyway, let me, what they call, exegete this for you. Let, let me walk through this passage for you very quickly. The Scripture says... Now the Spirit expressly says in latter times, in latter times, this is the word karyos. It has to do with season. It's not chronos. Chronos is the, the word we get for chronometer, the ticking of time. This is, the Spirit says in the latter keros. Keros. The latter seasons. The appointed time or season that we use. You know, when I'm in a season of my life. We say it like that. So, so the Spirit says that in the latter season, and the Scripture speaks of this latter season uh, in many ways. So this latter season, the Scripture says, and some will depart. Some will depart. Now this is uh, a future verb, and this word is made up, it's actually the word aphistomy, and it's made up of two words, which is apo and istomy, which means to stand from or to stand off from something that's been established. So the scripture says, in latter times, in latter seasons, 
some will in the future step out of what has been established. Abel from Istami to stand to establish. They will step out of, they will turn from, they will cause to withdraw or they will remove themselves from what? The scripture says the faith. And it's what we call articular here, which simply means that the the is front of it. It is the faith. It's the word tis pistios. Tis pistios, which simply means the content of the confessed Christian faith. Doctrine. Doctrine. Contrary to what a lot of people think or say and what some of these postmodern theologians say, uh, the scripture and the canon, how the Bible was put together, they judged the word of God by the doctrine of the apostles, which simply means they judged it by the teachings of the apostles. What, does the, what did the apostles say about who Jesus was? Doctrine. What did the apostles say about who God was? What did the doctrines, what did the apostles say about salvation? And so doctrine led to scripture, and now we as the church, we need to now let scripture inform our doctrine. But what's interesting is the church started off not by telling stories, as one postmodern says, but by doctrine. It was called the regular fide, the content of faith, the canon of faith, that which was once for all delivered to the saints, Jude 3. So... The scripture says in latter times, the latter season, some will depart. They're going to step away from what has been established, which is the faith, once for all, delivered to the saints, the content of the Christian faith. And now here's where it gets interesting. Devoting themselves, which is the word pros erchontos, which simply means they are holding on to, committed and they're staying committed to what we'll see deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. It comes from two words, pros and echo. Pros is the word uh, upon, to hold, or toward. And the word echo is this word to hold. So it means to, to hold upon, to grab upon, to, to hold in the hand. And now the tense of this verb means to grab it and continually to grab onto it and hold it. So in the last season, some will depart from what has been established, the content of the Christian faith. They're going to be holding on and continuing to hold on to the teachings of demons and deceitful spirits. My, 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 my. And what's interesting is the latter half of this passage gives us the medium through which these deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons through, which is the Greek word in, through it means the sphere, uh, sometimes translated in, but it's through, it's in the sphere of these liars. And literally the Greek is the hypocrisy of the liars. Now that's some strong language. It's not politically correct. The hypocrisy of liars. Those that speak false words. Now this polarization comes to us by way of defining your own truth. Determining what's true for you. What's true for me? Very narcissistic. Stephen Colbert said this. He coined a couple of phrases. Truthiness and wikiality. And he talked about the fact that today you have this website called Wikipedia. How many have, have frequented that site? Did you know that that site is not allowed to be used by teachers because there's so many errors? A lot of people are concerned about it. But what has happened in our day? There's this wikiality. Whatever we come up to and determine to be true, and if everybody votes on it, it becomes true. 
So Wikipedia, anybody can contribute to this online encyclopedia. Anybody. It's called the democratization of truth. I can't say that fast three times. So reality, truth, facts are determined by people getting together and making their own reality. Stephen Colbert says this. This wikiality is reality as determined by majority votes. He notes that any user can log in and make a change to any entry. And if enough users agree, it becomes the truth. This new wikiality, he says, together we can create a reality that we all can agree on because we just all agreed upon it. <laughs> and then this term, truthiness. He says it suggests the actual facts don't matter. You know, don't confuse me with the facts. What matters is how you feel. For you as the individual are the final arbiter of truth. Truthiness, Colbert says in an interview, is the sort of what you want to be true. As opposed to what the facts support. Truthiness is a truth larger than the facts. Because the facts would compromise the truthiness. <laughs> and if you care about the facts, you don't care about truthiness. This is where we are in our culture. Marshall Poe, writing in The Atlantic, actually said this. Wikipedia suggests a different theory of truth. If the community changes its mind and decides that 2 plus 2 is 5... And 2 plus 2 is 5. Very, very interesting. One scholar noted, he said, in this wiki world, there are 1 billion personalized truths. 1 billion personalized truths. And technology has helped it along. It's the new battle today. It's the apostasy that is in the culture, and now it is in the church. Let me read for you a couple of things. Now, what these evangelical leaders are trying to do is they're trying to put Christianity in the context of this postmodernism. Now, I belabored the point in order to show you that ultimately what is in the culture has been wholeheartedly accepted in the church today. And now because everybody determines their doctrine according to their politics, you can just simply take what is in the culture and know what people are teaching in the church today. We've stepped away from doctrine altogether. We're into this individualized self-improvement. You know, you hear the the sermon, Seven Ways to Live Financially Free. Three ways to have a great relationship. You know, that kind of stuff. There's no more doctrine taught anymore. And it's left a vacuum. And these emergent leaders have come in. Leonard Sweet. He's a United Methodist clergyman. Professor of Evangelism at Drew Theological Seminary. The visiting professor at George Fox University in Newburgh, Oregon. And he says this. Unitary, which is universalism, everybody's saved. Unitary thinking, the highest level of understanding reality, opens us up to a wider sensory realm. A mystical dimension of the divine. It also heals the divisions that separate us. The polarization that's in America. He says it heals the divisions that separate us from one another and life's and from one another and life's highest values. He goes on, he says, spirituality refers first of all to the universal gift of aliveness that exists within all religions and outside of religions. Now, Leonard Sweet, if you go to a church growth conference, you might get this guy showing up. Everybody's saved now. And there is an aliveness, not only in Christianity, but in Catholicism, 
in Buddhism, in Hinduism, in Islam. All values, all truths are equal because we live in a truthy world now. Now listen to this. He says, the Bible tells us that the human species has been twice kissed by the divine. What does he mean by that? Well, one of those kisses is the atonement of Christ that saves everybody. Everybody's saved. It doesn't matter what religion you're part of. It doesn't matter. There's no hell anymore. The Bible is really not the word of God. The Bible is this, this evolutionized book that people have brought together. And it's in community that we learn how to live. It's amazing. He says this. He says a, surpri a surprisingly central feature of all the world's religion is the language of light in communicating the divine and symbolizing the union of the human with the divine. Now look at what he's saying. He's saying all the religions are a divine light. He says Muhammad's light-filled cave, Moses' burning bush, Paul's blinding light, Fox's inner light, Krishna's lord of light, he goes on and on and he says, Life is the common thread that ties together near-death experiences as they occur in various cultures. Ghosts, ghost hunting, near-death experiences. Man, I have read probably 20 books on near-death experiences. Ryan McLaren, he insists that Christians have long been reading the Bible through the distorted lens of Greco-Roman Narrative. This narrative produced false dualism, an air of superiority, and a false distinction between those who are in and those who are out. Now, Brian McLaren actually in September 2012 made headlines by participating in the gay marriage ceremony of his son Trevor to his lover Owen. On and on and on. I wish I had more time. So what we have, the last week we're together. We're going to uh, kind of reiterate what we've shared. Maybe I'll be able to share some more of these things with you. We are living in a very interesting time, and the compromise is truth. People are compromising the truth in order to reach the culture. Pragmatism, whatever works. Churches are growing, but they're not growing with regenerated people. As I close, just remember this. We must speak the truth in love. Amen. Love without truth is emotionalism. Truth without love is legalism. Love with truth is verism or realism.